Welcome to Mozilla's How It's Made, where we look at how we make the things that help us keep the web free and open. I'm Andrew Krug, a security engineer here at Mozilla, and I'll be hosting here with you to the end of the episode. This will hopefully be the first episode of many episodes to explore the different aspects of projects going on with Mozilla Identity and Access Initiative. Mozilla is currently in the process of converting its internal web properties to Auth0 and OpenID Connect from Okta and SAML authentication in order to empower community and staff to participate in more projects here at Mozilla. The first thing we're going to talk about is a project that's near and dear to me, mostly because it was one of the very first projects I got to start at Mozilla, the single sign-on dashboard. Now, Okta has one of these things, and it looks a bit like this. Big page of links dynamically rendered based on apps you have access to. You get this with any Okta subscription, so you don't have a lot of control over it, and you certainly can't make it linked to other identity providers like Auth0. So in Mozilla fashion, we started our very own open source project to replicate the functionality in the Okta SSO dashboard and hopefully make the user experience a tiny bit better in the process. So what are the core features? As a user, I should see the applications I have access to in the grid. As a user, when I sign into an application, the experience is a single sign-on or federated access experience which means I don't have to log in over and over again. And as a user, I can search for a specific application and get the right tile based on the name of the application. Sounds easy, right? Mostly, but there's a lot of cool layers of orchestration that go into making that experience rock solid, highly available, and fun to work on for our development team. Let's start by talking about the project. Mozilla loves Python. In fact, it's the most popular language on profiles on mozillians.org. So the project is built in a lightweight framework called Python Flask. The project can be found here. It's in our Mozilla IAM GitHub organization. You'll have to pardon the dust, as we're really just productionalizing the application. So all the pieces and parts of the documentation might not be quite there, but it is 100% Flask framework and 100% Python. The project structure is relatively basic, where most routes to the application are stored in app.py, and each other piece of functionality is in a small single responsibility library that gets pulled in to create the end result, which is that big page of customized links. Outside of the Flask framework, we make use of Flask Pi OIDC for OpenID Connect implementation and the Watchtower library for logging to AWS CloudWatch. We'll dig more into logging and instrumentation in just a bit. How does the application know which apps surrender for a user, you may ask? Well, that's a complex question. Let's go to the code. The application itself is driven by a file called apps.yml, which lives in a different GitHub repository, SSO dashboard configuration. That file has continuous integration and gets stored in Amazon S3. Periodically, the application runs a small bit of code to see if that file has changed and pulls it down when the S3 E tag changes. E tags in S3 are a checksum that Amazon automatically creates for you when you put a file. So that takes care of where the config file comes from. But what's in the config file? The config file has a list of applications. For each application in the list, there are a few attributes. Name, name of the application, OP or Identity Provider, Okta or Auth0 in this case, URL, which is where the hyperlink should go, logo, which icon to show, users, what individuals should see this tile, groups, what groups of users should see the tile, display, which is a way for us to hide tiles from all users, and vanity URL, which is a way to have a URL like sso.alizom.org slash gmail give you a 301 redirect to the relying party URL and get you signed in. This is all parsed by a snippet of code in the user class of the project. The user class compares your groups and user information provided in the OpenID Connect assertion, which looks just like this, and then decides which app tiles to render in the view. Pretty cool, right? Just wait, there's more. All of this developer workflow is locally tested and run using Ansible Container. Ansible Container is a project where you can write pure Ansible 
and it builds a Docker container or containers without having to use clunky bash driven Docker files. You can even pull in roles from regular Ansible plays to get the job done. My playbook is hosted here and looks a little like this. When I want to test the application locally, I simply run Ansible container build. And then after some time, when the container is built, I run Ansible container run. The application then prompts me for my AWS MFA token because it has to pull a few things from Amazon and boots up. Now I know when testing locally that I'm doing it with the exact same container environment that would be deployed in production. In addition to the main.yml Ansible playbook, there's a container.yml. Think of this as a replacement for Docker Compose. In fact, it looks a little bit like Docker Compose, right? One of the things I really like about this file is that it lets you have what are called dev overrides. This means that you can push different environment vars and settings into the container when running locally versus running in production. The production settings only kick in when you run Ansible container with the dash dash production flag. This application has a number of secrets that are different for development and production. They all have one thing in common though, and that's that they are all coming from another project we love at Mozilla called CredStash. CredStash is a super awesome secret storage vault that runs using Amazon KMS and DynamoDB. So none of our secrets need be versioned with the application and can be different per environment, region, or AWS account. We love CredStash for keeping us safe from doing things like committing our secrets to Git. At 30,000 feet, that's the project and how it's put together. Now let's talk about how some code becomes a web server. The application is hosted in two different accounts at Mozilla. The development instance is hosted in InfoSec Dev, aka sso.alizom.org, and the production application is hosted in InfoSec Prod, aka sso.mozilla.com. Both of these apps have continuous integration pipelines set up. If you don't speak developer, that means that any time new code comes into the source control repository, it automatically makes its way to the appropriate account in the safest way possible. In our case, we use the production branch in GitHub for production and the standard GitHub master branch for dev. Both of these are protected branches that require plus run one reviewer and testing to merge code in. When the code is merged to one of the two of these branches, services like AWS Code Deploy and AWS Code Pipeline start to work on packaging the release and deploying it to one node at a time using simple bash scripts. If any one node fails deployment, the deployment is rolled back and aborted to ensure environment uptime. Outside of the continuous integration pipeline, the environment itself is built using AWS CloudFormation. CloudFormation can really do a lot. In fact, it does so many things, it might be a Turing complete language. Just kidding, but it can really do a lot. This project has two separate CloudFormation templates. The first creates all the roles the application needs to do its job. The second creates the servers, load balancers, lifecycle hooks, and associates the appropriate certificate. Currently, the dashboard is only supported across three AWS availability zones in US West 2, but will eventually move to multi-region later this quarter, expanding to Virginia and Frankfurt AWS regions. For convenience, in the repository, there are a couple of bash scripts that set the appropriate default AWS account, provision the CloudFormation stack, and add the AWS KMS grant for CredStash, allowing this instance of the stack to only read the minimum set of secrets it needs and not all the secrets. This is the kind of secret sauce that allows us to have multiple high security apps in the same account. So again, we love CredStash and what it gets us in the form of a secret store. What does the AWS architecture look like, you may ask? Well, it looks like this. Route 53 does region-based load balancing and health checks to route traffic to an application load balancer. That load balancer is tied to an AWS target group that contains machines deployed using AWS Autoscale and Lifecycle Hooks. Lifecycle Hooks are essentially fancy bash scripts that run whenever a server is born. They make sure the application is initially loaded from the appropriate branch in Git, turn on Fluent D, MIG, 
audit D, and more. In our case, we have a slightly different lifecycle hook for development and production, but they all live in the same CloudFormation stack template. They use what's called a CloudFormation conditional to know which environment we're working in and do the right thing. If a node lifecycle hook doesn't successfully complete, it's never joined to the load balancer. The default size for our auto scale groups is three nodes and can swing up to five without user interve intervention based on scale up needs. Each node or worker runs three containers, Flask plus Nginx, FluentD, and a Redis container, which will later be used for a WebSockets-based security alert system. The entire stack takes approximately 10 minutes to deploy using our gold standard AMI for the worker nodes. The gold standard AMI is built immutably without touch using HashiCorp Packer from the Packer Gold repository in IAM. All nodes are automatically patched prior to joining the auto scale group in addition to patching at build time. While the application is running, we instrument user application usage with Google Tag Manager and Watchtower logs. Watchtower is a Python module that logs to AWS CloudWatch. In our case, we use it to track user usage of the vanity URL feature, status of the migration from Okta to Auth0, and also capture any stack traces from the G-Unicorn workers in the Flask environment. This means that the workers themselves can be treated as ephemeral without any loss of log fidelity. It also means that CloudWatch metrics can be used for server health and relying party cutover metrics for reporting status of the project. What's next, you may ask? The next items for the project will be to instrument more logging, add a security alert center to the project, and an additional profile editor menu that will link back to mozillians.org. How can you help? You can report any issues directly to us and give feedback on Mozilla's discourse page or talk with us on Pound IAM on IRC. Lastly, special thanks to a few other contributors to the repository, particularly the contributions of Nikos, aka Kamarzad, and Megan, aka M. Branson, and really all of the Parsis and InfoSec team for working together to get this deployed done on time. Once again, I'm Andrew Krug, and this was Mozilla's How It's Made.